Howdy and welcome into another edition of the Luchador Broadcast brought to you by Academy Sports and Outdoors as Texas A&M falls to South Carolina at South Carolina 44 to 20. We're here in the Rollo Insurance Studio and uh, before we get started on the football side of things, we still have to go shopping. I know it sounds such like a, a, oh, a thing my it. wife would say, but like my, uh, yeah, I'm all about going shopping. But we we we've been saying for two <clears> weeks in a row we're going to go buy some my gear. Week. Let's go. I have to go this week because I'm I'm going, going my, hunting. I'm yeah, going hunting on Thursday or Wednesday mm -hmm. afternoon. So, with my good friend Roger Krager, it, who I've never actually, met. Actually, I know Roger, and it, you, of course you do. Well, I've known him for a long time. Saw him actually saw him at the uh, LSU game. First time I'd seen him in a oh, while. Yeah? He's a dad now, a husband. Like it's been a minute since we've seen each other, but uh, oh yeah, we go way back. I've always. Liked him and his music, so y'all are gonna have a blast. That that tempts me to go, but you should go. Even if so, maybe I'll buy something for Krager to take for you to bring to him as yeah. a surprise from Academy. Yeah, I was thinking about getting some jackets. I know he's got a lot of uh, jacket. Yeah, because like it's you know it won't be cold this week per se, but like since this is my new <clears throat> hobby, get you a good like Carhartt looking yeah, thing. Or, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. All right, camo uh, jacket. Get a camo jacket. I want the paint. Forget a camo shirt. Get a camo, like something like this, but yeah. camo. Carson Beck camo paint yeah. across the face, like you, commando. You, you, I feel like you'd play quarterback like Carson Beck. Carson Beck does not <laughs> seem like he's getting his paint from Academy. So shall we talk about the bad night all around in Columbia? Billy? What else are we going to talk about? Well, I mean, it was it wasn't what any of us expected. No. And even when it was, okay. I said this yesterday. Part of it is, but I'll explain that later. Even when it was a 10-point game with five minutes left, mm -hmm. it still felt insurmountable is not the right word. Mm -hmm. We needed a huge break. We didn't get the huge break. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like unless they get an, a massive pick six, it just I just didn't mm -hmm. feel it happening. And there was a couple of times I was like, oh, did he fumble? Is, that, is he going to take that to the house? And no, obviously it was a pass. Um, yeah, the the breaks didn't go A and M's way this week, no. and it felt like they needed a huge break to go. <clears throat> and this is after climbing out of a huge hole to start the game with. Yeah, it, I was, you know, I'm always like expecting close games and expecting battles in the SEC, even against the lower, <clears throat> the lower end teams. I'm always kind of. You know, whether they're playing Arkansas or at Mississippi State, I'm, I always just, over the last 12 years, you expect to go in and have to battle them. There was just maybe one stretch in, in A&M's history in this league that I didn't expect battles, and that was with Johnny in the second half of that season. Because in that first half, I mean, I remember them going to Mississippi State and Starkville, and we're like, man, this is going to be a dogfight. Right. They were ranked 15th, and you were going in there. So, I mean... This is tiny little window. In 2020, they were battles every week, just about, and we expected them to be anyway. I knew this one would be a battle, and I, it, it was the one game out of, and I think I may have even said this prior, I worried more about that one than I did LSU. Yeah. Because I felt like South Carolina is every bit as good a team as LSU. I really do. If you look, they... They, could go they got it handled. They got it handed to them by Ole Miss. Okay, they got it handed to them. I think that was Sellers' first game back. He got hurt against LSU. They were up seventeen. Not, not when he got hurt, but they were up seventeen nothing. They jumped on him just like they jumped on A and M. LSU fought back. Sellers got hurt, or I think they they beat them comfortably. Then you had the whole pick six thing. They went to Bama. They missed a two-point conversion to tie it in the final minute. They recovered an onside. They threw down the field deep, missed it to, to, to uh, win the game. Same thing uh, at, in Baton Rouge. Even with all that, they kicked a 49-yard field goal, missed it for the win, walk-off win there. So I watched both those games, and both times I was going, man, I want South Carolina to get this damn win because they're going to get it this year against somebody. Because you could tell they were that good. Yeah, their defense is that good. Their offense is unique. It, it's it's a tough, unique combo. And that bye week had Sanders and Sellers as healthy as they were all year. Particularly Sanders, who looked like the fourteen hundred yard back he was at Arkansas. Mm -hmm. He he absolutely. I mean, he embarrassed the Aggies. Both those guys did. But I think 
Sanders in particular. Sellers was just great at avoiding pressure. I mean, he did. Trim, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I was worried that this was their toughest game. Texas, Notre Dame uh, on the bookends. I mean, I think I'd put A and M going up to South Bend, and and I would take their chances just as much as playing South Carolina right now. Like I think South Carolina is on the level of a lot of teams, including the Aggies and LSU. And I mean, they played LSU, Bama off their feet. They pulled away from A and M down the stretch. Now, granted, it really felt and looked like it was A and M's worst day. On a good day, that's a dogfight. On a good day, the second half, you know, you you play. You just toe to toe in the second half, and and either team wins it late. Um, it was not a good day for the Aggies. It was really disappointing, David, that they picked that week to play their worst game. They didn't overlook the Gamecocks. Elko said too much. There there was too much that happened two years ago. They went up there and scoreboard didn't say it as much as it does here, but it essentially got beat up and beat around in that one with. Uh, you know, Leggett returned the opening kick. I think that was 17 nothing, very quickly. They, You knew what you're walking into. That's as big a home field advantage as Kyle Field uh, uh, at their peak. Not game to game to game, but that place at night in a game like that is as loud and intimidating yep. as Death Valley, Kyle Field, Bryant Denny, the Swamp, although I've not seen the Swamp up yet. But it's as daunting as anywhere to play. It, it's, it's worse than Ole Miss. It's worse than the Cowbells. To me, it's worse than what I've seen in the Swamp. I'd put it up there with my loudest of, of Bryant Denny, Death Valley, Neyland Stadium, Kyle Field. It's like that. Yeah. So you can't let them go up on you 14 nothing. You can't let them start making big plays in the second half. You can't let them stuff you on fourth down. You can't let them feel that momentum because just like what happened to LSU a week ago here, it will snowball. And I know it's South Carolina, and I know we've grown used to beating them. You're 0-2 in your last two trips out there. That team, if you look at the junior and senior classes, I I would challenge anyone to show me because we talk about A&M's talent. That team has every bit as much NFL talent on it as the Aggies do. I think the draft will will show us that. Do I think AM still should have won the game? Yeah. Yeah, because they had more to play for. Um, they're certainly not lacking in talent. And you'd like to think they could go up there and, and outcoach those guys. And what we've seen over the course of the season, eight games going into that one, right? I said last week, yeah, they should have beat LSU. They could have beat Bama. Texas AM body of work and what we've seen on the field tells me, well, A&M did beat LSU by 15 points. I think the Aggies could and, and probably would beat Bama. Okay? It rings differently after last night, but I'm talking about we said that last week coming yep. out of there. It was still a game that I think A&M should have won, and I think you definitely feel that way when you saw a 20-20 to halftime score with as bad as A&M started that football game. Um, they, they took a big blow when number eight got hurt. When Le'Veon Moss went down, that was a devastating blow to this offense, to their particularly identity. with Marcel, we got to their identity, short yardage the rest of the game, Marcel Reed under center. Like, he needed that ground game. Marcel, he was not anywhere near the top of their problems last night, but that's what you saw last night was a young quarterback that didn't need to be down 10 in the fourth quarter. He didn't need to spend the whole night behind the chains. Like that's uh, in that environment on the road against that defensive front. That was not conducive to a young and experienced quarterback. And guess what? I said the same thing about Garrett Nussmeyer coming in here. People forgot because he's so good. This is still a, he hasn't played a ton of football. He hasn't played in a ton of, truly intimidating road environments against good football. Against He hasn't played Garrett Nussmeyer. He had not played in a bunch of really daunting road environments against a great defense in his time. Neither had Marcel. 
And Nuss was a little older. I think he's a year older. But still, what you saw was that dude did not need to throw the ball 50 times and be pressured all night. That was not how LSU was going to win that game. That's not, that wasn't like his wheelhouse. Right now, Marcel's wheelhouse is not to try to sling it around and lead them back and, and play behind the sticks all night and behind on the scoreboard. And that's, that's what happened. And a, a lot of that had to do with Moss's injury, I think. He's a stabilizing force. He's one of the best in the SEC. Uh, another part of that, you know, had to do with this defense just getting off to horrific starts. In well, and the tackling, First really, half and the second half. The tackling, I, I, I noticed it in the LSU game, especially yeah. in the first half. Like, they're just not wrapping up. They're, they're doing a lot of arm tackling. And I promise you, I thought they sacked from the press box. It looked like, oh, they got him. I know. And then three seconds later, he's still running. I'm like, wait, wait, the play was dead. He, the little Harry Houdini there. Well, first off, credit Sellers, Sanders, Beamer, that defense, all of it, the, the atmosphere. I've got to do a damn rooster crow on SEC now this morning. Tomorrow. Bet Alyssa. She was going to have to do a, a gigum. So. There we go. But I feel like Doring now in this thing. But, look, to me, like, credit them for going out and winning. It was a bad – and people can call it an excuse. Man, it's life in the SEC. And you guys can sit here, whoever wants to, and we know who you are. You want to say excuses or whatever. It's just the reality of life in this conference. Yes, you can go win on the road. True championship contenders – We'll go win games like this on the road. But this year, even those teams are not winning. And we don't know if a and a true championship contender or not. It's going to depend on how they do in these next two conference games, particularly against Auburn on the road. And then can you set up that showdown for it, which I'm on, it's almost certain that if A&M beats Auburn, that is going to be for one of the two spots in the SEC title game. Yep. I don't think Texas will lose to a – Ninth string Florida quarterback at home, Kentucky, or to a horrific Kentucky team at home, who, who by the way, South Carolina beat thirty-one to six, or to Arkansas on the road, probably against their backup quarterback. You know, the Florida guy, the Arkansas guy, they basically are incapable of completing downfield passes, and that's who they're playing. So, I do think if A&M handles their business, they will be playing Texas for a berth in the SEC title game. We'll get back to this game in a minute, but I just want to say, we sat here after Notre Dame, and I try to tell people, like, relax. Like, mm -hmm. be critical. Talk about what concerned, what, what you hated about last night, what concerns you about that moving forward. But do not become one of these, I'm sorry, like dumbasses that go to Twitter and go to message boards and just throw the whole thing out the window. Like, if you're worried that, that this performance last night scares you that AM can even go win at Auburn, much less beat Texas, I get it. It's understandable. I would advise you, though, to remember the first eight games of this con or first uh, six games of this conference schedule, or five, they were five and oh. Remember the first five, and I would say, remember what you were saying after Notre Dame, remember what you were saying and thinking a week ago. Because it's a hell of a lot different. Yep. And the truth is somewhere in between. And then apply that to the rest of this conference. So what I'm telling you, <clears throat> if you're sitting there trying to wonder how you feel about this, Tennessee went and lost at night at Arkansas. Okay? That's an Arkansas team that's given up like a, oh, well over 100 points their last two games to LSU and, and uh, LSU and Ole Miss at home. Tennessee scored like 13, 14. Yep. They lose them. Bama beats Georgia. Georgia's down 28-0 to a Bama team that not beating people 28-0. Then Bama comes back the next week and loses at Vandy. Then they lose to that Tennessee team that lost to Arkansas. Ole Miss, they're supposed to have the greatest season in their program history. They lose to Kentucky. They go lose to the, a &M team, uh, the LSU team that A&M beat by 15 a week ago. LSU came in here riding high. They were going to, you know, Beat the world. They were unstoppable. They're up 17-7. They get outscored 31-6. to Okay? 
Texas, number one ranked, unbeaten, taking over the SEC. A Georgia team that really can't score on anybody is up 23-0 on them at halftime and smacks them all over DKR until they start throwing water bottles. There are other examples I'm sure I'm forgetting, but this conference right now, it will humble you real quick. And, and parity has set in like never before, and people aren't really uh, – I feel like fan bases from Knoxville to here to Tuscaloosa, people weren't ready for it to this level. You know, Tennessee should have lost to Florida. Georgia, prob- Georgia, if Lagway doesn't get hurt, probably loses to Florida. If Mertz doesn't get hurt, Tennessee probably. Florida wasn't even competitive against A&M earlier in the year. So you can be A&M, outscore LSU 31-6 to down the stretch, come back a week later, go on the road and get outscored 24-0 down the stretch. It's just, it, it is this year in the conference. I wish it didn't happen. We're going to talk about why and, and how much of that is a real concern moving forward, how much of that is, is disappointing, how much of it was really off-putting and, and like where you're just like, damn, that's unacceptable. And then how much of it you attribute to, dude, they, they legitimately ran into a buzzsaw and – they needed to bring their A game out there, and they didn't. And when you don't bring your A game, and there's no explaining the reasons why other than the environment got to you, the missed tackles piled up, the missed short yardage piled up, it snowballed on them. Penalties. Uh, penalties. Uh, yeah, see, and that goes into that unacceptable part. Um, but anyway, it was a really bad night at the office. And you can just throw it all away and say, same old Aggie, season's over. And you can fall into that narrative that people are going to try to convince you of. But there's a reason people outside of this bubble were bullish on this football team two days ago, 24 hours ago. It wasn't because we were sitting here at Tex Ags saying so. It wasn't because Aggies on Twitter got excited about the football team or that, that Mike Elko and their social media team did a good job. Like People that watch the sport and cover this conference were bullish on A&M and their chances moving forward. And that was based entirely on what they'd seen on the field prior to last night. So just like you take what happened prior yep. to last night to give you hope, you don't take what happened last night and give your ass battered Aggie syndrome. I said it. I get it. in the cover story I wrote up. It's it's like the SEC shorts crew. This week, it's like hope versus battered Aggie syndrome. Which one do you want to choose? Because I can give you five examples why you should be hopeful, and I can give you one big example why you should have you know cling to your BAS right now. But to me, like they got an off week. They got New Mexico State. They got Auburn. That's three weeks between last night and the Auburn game. It's four weeks, four weeks, a month between last night when they played Texas. This is year one under Mike Elko. Uh, That was their worst performance of the season, probably on every level. I think coaches, players, all of them would say it. All of them would raise their hand and say, my fault. Didn't do enough. You know, didn't get the job done, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. You go through this game and try to figure out why but for every play you want to change, I could give you two that South Carolina made. You, got, you, got, you went up there and got your ass kicked, and you looked up today, and the sun came up, and despite what Twitter wants to tell you, you've got two games left in the conference, one where you're going to be a road favorite against a team that is talented but has struggled all year, and then if you win that, you set up Texas A&M, hosting the Texas Longhorns, where the winner probably goes to Atlanta in year one under this head coach and this, this regime. Um, you're not there yet. We saw what can happen on the road in this yep. league. A&M was the victim last night. It's somebody different every week. It really is. It's somebody different every week, especially this year. But that's what stands in the way of, of that and, and – you know, playing for, at worst, a 9-3 and three season, at best, a chance to not only beat Texas, but go to Atlanta. And for anybody that's saying that the Aggies can't beat Texas, I guess the only thing I would say is let this team get a little healthier, 
let them figure out how to get this this run game going a little more and I guess let Quinn Ewers dodge some of those sacks that Sellers yeah. did last night. Anybody else? One or two of those sacks go down. I think the game feels different, Billy. Just one or two. I'm not asking for all of them. Well, that, that first drive. How instance. about how about I give you four of the twelve times it happened? I mean, four of the twelve times it happened. I mean, it. Yeah, that first drive. <clears throat> was it the second play of the game or the third? I think it was the second play of the game. It was. It was. Uh, you would have set up a third and eighteen yeah, or something. Yeah. Yeah. And and you. It must. It might not have been the second because they might have got a first down. So yeah. Uh, Incomplete. Yeah, there it was. It's incomplete on first down. On second down, Scooby, Scooby Williams comes in untouched. So many of those blitzes were dialed up and executed perfect. to perfection, except the finish. Yeah. But on that play, Scooby comes in, he hits him. If he takes him down, it's like third and 16, right off the bat. A, that's a perfect place to get that offense in. Because yep. that's not, it's kind of like AM right now. That is not what they do well. There are some teams that can, like Texas can get away with that. LSU can maybe get away with that. It's still not optimal, but those offenses are more built to these teams right now, as they're constructed, are not built for that. They probably punt. Instead, you know, nine plays later, they're in the end zone. It's 7 nothing, and that place is going nuts, and you've set a tone for the entire, the entire game. But, yeah, that was just... That, that same drive, they went for it on fourth and one, too. Yep. And they got their fourth yep. and one. And that was just one of many. Uh, look, this game looks a lot different if they could tackle. And it's easier said than done. For, forget about all the missed tackles in other parts of the field. But just get home on blitzes mm -hmm. that were designed and executed right up to the finish. And, and that worked. Or pass rush and, and like, Get home, not, not even get home on the pass rush. I mean, just take the guy down when you hit him. And the number of times he extended plays, I don't know. You'd have to go in. So I'm sure somebody will go watch this from this standpoint <clears throat> and just see how many times they could have taken him down to put them, like, massively behind the chains. And that doesn't even count for, like, that second play of the game where not only was it not a drive-killing play, but they gained 20 yards. Right. How many times did that happen? And what was the cumulative toll on this A&M defense in terms of just fatigue, in terms of frustration setting in, in terms of just hesitation and taking bad aim? I mean, there was a lot of things that that is a cumulative effect. And, and again, credit Sellers. He did an amazing job, but my point is this. That dude was sacked 25 times this year coming in. So no matter what, we, 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 he's not Cam Newton, okay? He is really good. Again, LSU saw him at full strength. He was a problem. Yeah. He was a problem for Bama. But he still been sacked 25 times coming into that one. A&M, it felt like, had 25 shots at him. They didn't drop him once. Yeah, he can take a hit, man. He can, but, but 25 times he went down. So, again, the Aggies have no one to blame but themselves. I'll give him credit. I, I think he just got into a zone to where he was, he was feeling it. But still, bottom line, you don't have to sack him every time you got a shot on him. But you've got to get him some of those chances. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think one or two, David. I think with the amount of times they pressured and got to him, they should have sacked him a half dozen times. Sure. And, and they were unable to take him down. And that was a huge, huge part of this game. So was the fact that, you know, A&M couldn't execute short yardage in, in a couple massive uh, positions. Really, like, I think maybe is it four of them. It was at least three. The two fourth downs they went on and the other one where they had to punt. Right. And the TV, they made way too big a deal of that. I was watching that late or this morning. They made way too big a deal about Elko punting there. Uh, after going for it twice on fourth down, it's like, they're like, well, now you're only down 10. And it was, that wasn't the one with five minutes left. This was prior to that. You're only down 10. Like, it, if you, you know, it's not optimal, but to get stuffed right there. And the thing is, at some point, and this is where I don't know, Nuno, and I'd like to hear the, what the listeners and subscribers think. 
you know, my buddy does it all the time, Dan, up there in Detroit. I don't, he did it earlier today on fourth and goal from the, you know, inside the five and they got it. He does it all the time, fourth and one or, or less, and he goes. Um, I get really anxious when you do it inside your own 40, mm-hmm. early in the game, on the road. But I, also, but I also like a head coach that's not scared. Mm-hmm. So I'm torn. I'm almost one of these people that's going to like it if it works and complain. I, I like the idea that, hey, you know, they just went, 75 on us. We need to keep the ball here. You know, we need to get our offense in a rhythm. I only need a foot or a yard. I think I can get there or whatever, you know. And But also you've got to – he's got to show over time, and only time will tell, that he's got a good feel for the flow of the game. I think that early one, as rough as it is to look at and go, but you had – you still – you had – Le'Veon wasn't hurt yet, right? That was uh, the first one. No, he, yeah. So he was hurt you, for the second you, one. That was the QB sneak. Was the first one. So you oh, yeah. you could question the the play, the call. But I'm also hey, I'm also the guy that was complaining later in the game when they went for it on fourth down out of the shotgun. So I mean, which one is it? Right. So I get it. It's risky. I don't mind a risk taker, but you know it's got to work. You know it's got to work, and and as long as over time. Mike Elko start, you know, shows, and I think he will, that he's got, it's not just an automatic, hey, less than one, we go for it. It's got to have something to do with how the game's gone, what you think of that specific, I, I don't like a robot there. Right. Less than one go anywhere on the field, or anywhere outside of our 35 or more, you know, how I don't like that. Um, so, actually, I was kind of glad when he punted later in that game because my take was how many times do they have to stop you before you quit doing it and, and, you know, making things even tougher on yourself. So having Le'Veon healthy the whole game changes that. I think, to me, I feel more comfortable the second time going. Yeah. Hey, Dave, you're playing without Le'Veon and and Basantis. That is killing you right now. And Amari Daniels has been, like I've said before, he's one of the unsung guys on this football team. He had a massive play last night. I mean, he goes, how far do you go? 56. 56. Amari runs tough. He had a massive play there. But Le'Veon Moss is, is an all-SEC back. You know, and, and now with this injury, and he, he, won't, he won't get there to be a first team, but he's played this year at an all-SEC level. And to not have him, and, and, and TJ Shanahan will fight your ass in there, but Chase Besantis is a first team all SEC left guard. He's play, he was playing at that level. So to take those two guys out of it, and you saw Major. it last night, you know, Shanahan looked like a young guy that hadn't played a lot of football. Dewberry looked like a guy that was going up against, you know, uh, NFL D-line the other last night. And, and it showed. And, and they weren't the only ones getting beat. Some of the veterans were too. Coley, I thought, had a rough night in the middle. Like, that was the first game where I'd say the Aggie O-line, they got it handed to them. Yeah. It's the first time in, in, in nine games. They've had a hell of a season. They went on the road. They were, they were without a key guy, and they got it handed to them. Um, how they respond will be big. How they play at Auburn, how they play at, at, against Texas, I really hope to see 71 back. I think, I think we will. I just Will it be in time for Auburn? That would be optimal because I'm telling you, that dude, I think those are your two best offensive players. Marcel's the biggest playmaker. But I think those two guys, Moss and Basantis, like as far as like week to week to week to what they're, those are two guys that have been performing at an actual dominant level. And you take them out, and, and it's not a shocker that playing on the road against the best defensive front, and I mean front seven, that they've probably seen this year, right? I mean, it's LSU. I mean, it's 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 South Carolina or, or Notre, Notre Dame. Dame. And I think front seven wise, I think that That's group better. might be better. Yeah, I think they are um, by any metric, like NFL talent. Just watching it, and so it's it's not shocking that that group, you know, got the best of you. You, you needed to be at full strength, but more importantly, you needed to play your A game. 
And A and M played about a, a quarter and a half of an A game, and then they played like a C game or worse. Yeah. The rest, of, I mean, they were. Re- it was your worst tackling effort of the season. It was your worst effort of the season, and this is all tied in. Worst effort of the season against the run. Most points you've allowed, right? I mean, just and, and that got that point totals deceiving. That happened in an ambush late, but that was also still pretty indicative about how much they beat you in that second yeah. half. I mean, I don't think that's like a deceiving score. I think you just could have gotten away with 30 to 20. Um, man, and then you had the pivotal play of that game. There were a lot of them, but that interception in the fourth quarter, I mean, that was your, that was, it was kind of like, that was your last chance. And you had the ball with what? You had a chance to put points, regardless, seven or three. You're either cutting it to a touchdown or a field goal with almost a whole quarter to go, right? When did that? That happened. uh, When did that go down? That was in the fourth quarter early. With like 10 minutes left, right? Yeah, yeah, it was at least 10 minutes left. You're literally in the first minute. You're in the first minute of the fourth quarter down 10. And you're moving. You're moving the ball. This drive ended. It was a six-play, six 60-yard drive until that point. So you'd move 60 yards. You're inside the South Carolina 30. You just converted the third down. It's first and 10. So you're 28 yards. You're already at a 45-yard field goal. Bond has been nails. He's been nails all year. You're probably cutting it to a touchdown with a whole quarter to go, or you're cutting it to a field goal with a whole quarter to go. I mean, that was – and then they pick six. It Luckily, the guy had stepped out of bounds. Um, but that was – and and A&M ended up stopping him. Yep, they ended up punting. And they got the ball right back. But then they went three and out. And then it was – and then South Carolina scored, and that was pretty much it. So – or no, shoot, you stopped him twice in a row. You got the ball back a third time down 30 to 20 and could do nothing with it. So – but that was your best chance. You cut that thing to a score with a whole quarter to go on the road despite everything working against you and make it that big of a struggle and get that thing to 30 to 27, it's a ball game, period. No matter how much better than they were than you yep. that night. And, and so that was, a, and that, was, that was a down where, like, look, Marcel's going to learn, like, throw that thing away. He will. But he didn't. He didn't last night. He said he was trying to throw it. He just did he. He yeah. didn't get enough on. Yeah, I mean that's part of that pressure too. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the physical pressure, more so than the you, big game pressure. You mentioned that play, and look, a lot of football was played after this. But I'm curious, and Nick and I were talking about this before the show. If A and M does not give up that late field goal at the end of the second quarter, what 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 does it feel like going into the third quarter? Because it looked, you stole momentum for, what, a minute 20? That's it, right? You, you take the lead, the crowd is hushed, yeah. and then they go back and score a, a field goal a minute 20 later. I mean, look, if you'd outscored them, you don't let them get that field goal, and you outscore them 20 to 3 to close out the first half, I definitely think it's a different feel going in the locker room. This is the second time in three games that A&M's let the opponent race down the field mm-hmm. um, for a field goal. Mississippi State actually scored a touchdown late. But they got the ball with a minute eight left. That is, that is, or that is not how South Carolina's built. And, and, and a really bad penalty by Shamar Turner. He's been doing this now way too much. Um, two of them again the other night. And I get it, like, I get, like, you're trying to make a play on the quarterback. I, you know, some people say that's dirty and stuff. I mean, we've, over the years, last few years, we've started to call that dirty. That's, that's what, that's called trying to make a, you know, sack on the quarterback. He's getting blocked. He dies in to make a play. I understand it's a legitimate penalty in 2024. It's by the rules. That's 100% a penalty. Um, and then I know what he did on that other play where Mays got the fumble. He didn't see that Mays' knee went down. Mays kept running. But he comes flying in to kind of blindside, you know, get the guy that's not really paying attention. Just bad penalties that you don't need. And, and here's the problem. You had one last week. Yet there, there's too much. He, he's walking on the wrong side of the line, and it's hurting his team. 
and someone needs to someone needs to say something to them, and, and probably more so a teammate uh, than even coaches. You know, that's got to be something like that. That's where leadership comes in because he's a hell of a player yep. and he does care. It's not like he's not out there. He's giving actually hella effort. He competes as much as anybody, almost to a fault. But that penalty hurts you, and then. You know, you get the sack, force fumble. What if they don't call that? That that had nothing to do with with the play. That, but it, it was a penalty. He grabbed him. I mean, if you want to call that on every play, you can. But usually, when it's out in the open like that, they're going to see it. But you get the sack, force fumble. Probably get off a field goal try. Yep. You have time for maybe a play, timeout, or you know, out of bounds. Try kick a field goal. You might have been up twenty three seventeen, and been on a twenty three to three run. So, yeah, that, that did – I do think that changed momentum. You were getting the ball back to start the third quarter. You did nothing with it. That hurt. Um, it would have been really nice to see them continue that offensive momentum, right, <clears throat> and go down the field and score. Look, <clears throat> the offense was bad in the second half of this game. It was bad in the first half last week. Um it's, it's an enigma to me. People will go, well, because they weren't ready for Connor against Missouri and they weren't ready for Marcel. I don't think it's as simple as that. I do think LSU had issues. They were unprepared. But South Carolina prepared for Marcel all week. And he went how many drives in a row here? How many drives in a row did they go? Um, A&M went field goal punt, field goal TD, TD to end the half. Four out of five drives they scored in the, in the first half. 41-yard uh, drive, a 42-yard drive, 85 and, and 60. So, like, they had the offense clicking and going against a good defense. <clears throat> Four scores and five possessions, 20 points and a half. Yep. That, <laughs> they were on pace to go 38 against LSU and 40 against South Carolina. After going 41 and 34 against Missouri and Mississippi State, and then it just shut off. They shut it down, and they did a good job of taking away Marcel as a running threat, especially when Moss goes down. That's that's really problematic. Um, but they also exploited the fact that, look, it's until Marcel gains more experience, this is a tough. They they've got to just kind of. And it's on Colin Klein. Like you, yeah. it's, it's not easy. It's not. I know people think it should be, but he's got to get the ball pushed down the field more. But then again, receivers have to, you know, thank goodness Jabri Barber stepped up the way he is. But receivers got to start making plays. I am excited to see them sticking with Marcel in terms of like the receivers are understanding more how to kind of get open yep. for him after he gets out of the pocket. That because to me that's a, one of the ways out of this when you're trying to be like okay what are they doing in the passing game well part of it is scramble drill right, right, with right. Marcel and just or just not giving up on plays because you know what he can do so that was actually the most encouraging thing to me of the passing game but you know the other thing I saw people saying well if you took Connor out why didn't you take Marcel out well to me like it's to, it's it's apples to oranges because well, Marcel was moving the ball yeah. And I was going to say, and he didn't turn it over till late. That game was 27-20 midway. They're down 10. Your guy led you to, like I said, four out of five drives you scored to end the first half. So it's not even a thought. But Billy, it's not even a thought at halftime. And then as the game went on, it took till the fourth quarter where you started to go, man, he's starting to struggle. But my question is, how would that have set up better uh, for 15 in that one? The way they were getting after him, and Marcel kind of a he got sacked what once? Yeah, kind of avoided about six sacks of his own in there. Was it two? I think it was two at the end. But, two at the end. Uh, here, here's what I want to say: When Connor got benched against LSU, he had mm -hmm. completed four passes, I believe it was. Maybe yeah, six, right? It was really low. Yeah, and it forty-seven yards. And okay, a half. Marcel had was eighteen of twenty-eight, two hundred and six yards passing, and I know he had the the two turnovers late. Mm -hmm. He also rushed for 46 yards. Your quarterback gave you 250 yards against one of the better defenses you're going to – the better – maybe the best defense you're going to face all year. He wasn't good. It didn't look good, right? Yeah. We know that. But he, like you said, at the top of the Luchador, 
there were so many other problems on top of it. It wasn't, Marcel wasn't the issue. He no. did not have a good game, granted, but he moved the ball. And they were throwing the ball down the field, which is something we hadn't seen from him all season. He was, he was 8 of 12 at halftime with a touchdown. Like I said, led him to four scores, 103 yards passing, and, and 48 rushing. He had 150 yards yep. of offense, accounted for a touchdown, no turnovers, and, and led the offense to 20 points. That was, that was not, I don't think that was ever a thought that went through, uh, went through Mike Elko or Colin Klein's mind. But they do need to use the next couple weeks and, and really make that passing game more of, of a threat because Auburn and especially Texas, you know, they're just going to sit on it. And both those teams have guys that can beat blocks up front and make things really difficult, especially if you don't have, you know, DeSantis, DeSantis and especially Le'Veon Moss back. And again, I, it's, well, it's too early to know on, on Le'Veon. Uh, I just hate day after on knee injuries. It just it feels like it's so rare that you get like the good news. Mm -hmm. um, I could say, well, he wasn't on crutches. If they feared it was an ACL, I think they would have had him on crutches. I, I could say it, you know, for those that were, everyone was so adamant that he had broken his leg. I had all the doctors, you know, the wannabe doctors weighing in on my texts and stuff. Oh, broken leg, is obvious. wasn't that. I don't think they wouldn't have had him walking around yep. out there. Um, so you're hopeful on something like, and I, I have no idea. I'm saying like you're hopeful at some point if it's like an MCL. There's a month between A and M and Texas. Could have got. I, I just think I get I get nervous about like day after on obvious knee injuries, and that one looked it looked like. Yeah. You know, yeah. Hopefully, it's like some kind of hyperextension or an MCL or. a some kind of sprain, you know, but who knows, man, th th getting him back would be obviously massive. I mean, imagine if it was like a four-week thing and a guy was back for Texas and, and a potential SEC title game. Because, David, that is still on the table. And, and you know, and Reuben Owens teased it, or his, his dad did. Uh, you know, he's, a, he's ahead of schedule on the return. And, again, that's not – this week or New Mexico, probably not even Auburn. But again, I know, I know no one wants to hear it today. You don't. Texas struggled to pull away from Vandy, and I know Vandy's better, but it's like, I'm just telling you, if you're watching Texas play and you see what A&M does well, like, that should be a hell of a football game. If you're watching around this league Teams are having bad games, setback games. If you look at the schedule, you've got Georgia, Ole Miss. You've got Bama, LSU. You've got Georgia, Ole Miss, Bama, LSU, Georgia, Tennessee. Teams are going to be gone. They're going to be by the wayside in terms of a and M's not getting in in some massive two-way pileup. I guess they could, but let's just say they're not. Right. You've got probably comes down to the winner of Texas and A&M will go to the SEC title game against whoever. Some, like two of those three are probably going to be out of it. I suppose there's a world where Georgia and LSU could be in it, but I'm pretty sure people have already done the research and said that four-way tie, well, Texas would be out of it. That three-way tie of A&M, Georgia, LSU, a and M goes against LSU, which right. would be crazy. But with the way this season has gone, it's likely that Georgia, if, if we're just going realistically, there's going to be like enough carnage where if A and M wins their next two, they're in the SEC title yep. game. And again, nobody feels like that when I'm looking at 44 to 20. To a team that is record coming in, who's that's three and three in the SEC, but that's the reality. And look, this team could go lose at Auburn, or this team can beat Texas. At their best, they can beat Texas at Kyle Field. 
at their worst, they could go lose to Auburn or, Am- or get beat by 24 in South Carolina where they don't score a point in the second half. I mean, I think we saw them at their worst last night. Now it's like, how focused, how resilient, how tough, how healthy are you moving forward? So I just break. While I'm, I kind of wish they'd go play this weekend. They need it. They need the break to, like, I think, practice. Like, tackle it's that time of year. Like, hone in and, and revisit the tackling and fix some of the things you did wrong and, like, let Marcel get more and more reps. Yeah. You know, like, so I think the timing, the schedule sets up, actually. You get the bye. You don't have to worry about the bye hangover because even if you have it, you're going to beat New Mexico State. And then you ramped up to go on the road and, and like give it this final kick and then let Kyle Field take you home. Let the 12th man take you home against Texas. It's, you'd love to be 6-0 and right now. Um, hell, you'd have loved to have beaten Notre Dame. And a lot of people gave up and called this a rebuilding year after that. Raise your hand because a lot of you did. A lot of you did. Um, it's not a rebuilding year. There's still a lot on the table, like Elko said. Obviously, they're going to have to play a hell of a lot better than they did Saturday night because that was a stinker. Yeah. I think we're going to do something different. We're going to have Kay Nagley in here ask some questions because you, you put a thread up. So we'll pause here for a quick moment, and uh, Kay Nagley will join Billy here momentarily. What's so fun about fun? It can take any form. Be a sacred ritual. Who wants chicken? Or a random whim. For us, fun is everything. Academy Sports and Outdoors. Have fun out there. Well, we have a new guest. We do. Clay. <laughs> I was about to say Clay. Kay. Um, we, I just figured today with all the madness and I think people, I, I think people, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just didn't read enough, but I felt like people held it together. Somewhat, Somewhat yeah. compared to what I've seen in previous losses, which to me, I would hope that a lot of people would say, I'm frustrated, I'm pissed off with the way that one went. I know we could play better. It's bitterly disappointing. Um, at times, it was embarrassing the way they played, no question, uh, particularly down the stretch at the end of that game, obviously. But and, and, and there's a part of you that just gets so frustrated because you, you, you've you seen them play so much better and you saw them play that much better seven days earlier. Yeah. And it felt like not just to us but to everyone that it was going like this. And then it, it all comes crashing down. But like Elko said last night, and he's right, everything they want to accomplish is still out in front of them. It's not like you're saying that when you lose to Notre Dame and there's, oh, yeah, well, of yeah, course there is. The it's season. in front of everyone yeah. because – no one's played a conference game, and there's 11 games left. Mm-hmm. There's two conference games left, and everything's in front of you. And one of them's on the road against a team you're going to be favored over, and the other one is at home at Kyle Field where you feel like you're invincible at times. Yeah. So, anywho, figured people would want some questions. Nuno, I wanted to give him a little break. He's had a long day. He's been working hard. So, here you are. <laughs> well, let's do it. All right, we're going to get some questions. So, First and probably most popular question that people want answered is, why was tackling so poor? I have never seen it that poor. I, I cannot answer the first question they're going <laughs> to ask me. And, and I agree. It was, it was so bad, and it was, it was like, it, I've seen this in the past with A&M, but I've seen it, and I've seen tackling games this bad, but I haven't seen it from a team that for – Eight games had proven to be a, a good def- – they're a good defense. They're, they're at times they're very good. Um, they were just flat-out bad last night. They were flat-out bad. And I, and I know they missed a ton of tackles in Notre Dame, but they had gotten to be – where they. I mean, they were probably coming off their best half of defensive football of the season. You know, they, they just absolutely shut down an LSU offense that – with NFL talent, like high round talent at both tackle spots, at tight end, at wide receiver, at quarterback, they held that team to six second half points, took the ball away three times, and just shut it down. And I know one's at home and one's not, and I always say teams play better defense at home. Look what South Carolina did last night. 
Look what A&M did a week ago. I, that is a, always tips the scale significantly. Mm -hmm. But this is a good defensive football team. They have been for almost the entire season. It felt like they were peaking. And, man, I, I don't know. It's almost like they look like a team that we might see, like, coming off a of bye week. So I've seen bad tackling like this, but I've seen it by bad defenses. Mm -hmm. And when I've seen it in the past, that's, you, I do know that stuff can really become contagious. And, and for two reasons. Number one, it's just like guys start trying to do too much and guys start pressing. And, and, but the other thing is the other team starts to really feel it. And I see you break a tackle, so I want to break a tackle. And then we both break a tackle. And the next time that player tries to tackle somebody, they're tired and they're beat up. And mm -hmm. They just, as the game went on, started imposing their will, but it started. The only reason they were able to get going was how pitifully they, they were tackling in this one. So it was tough to see. Yeah. It was really disappointing. I, you know, it's one of those games I guarantee you everyone on that plane coming home was like, I wish we could, like, turn around and play that one again. Mm -hmm. And you might not have won, but you just didn't go out there and give your, the, the best effort, not effort, the best product on the field, the yeah. best performance that you could have given. Yeah, for sure. Uh, from this guy one, do we have to move Bussy to running back now? I mean, TBD, I talked a minute ago about Le'Veon Moss, so I think a lot of that will de depend on Le'Veon, and that's the name that would jump out at you. Um, you got Amari Daniels, you've got uh, EJ Smith, and after that, you, you've got nothing. So. They've got, they definitely need a contingency. Mm -hmm. He would seem like the obvious uh, fit in there. You've got time with a bye week to kind of experiment with some stuff, but you are now in emergency mode, at least until either Moss or Owens returns. And I don't even know if that's on the table with Moss. And if it is with Owens, is that on the table for Auburn, for Texas, for potential postseason? When is that? Uh, I do believe he's, you know, was his dad tweeted about it. He's ahead of he's ahead of schedule, but that's also like that's just guesswork from now until then. Yeah. Uh, any truth to the rumor that the team was sick, or was this just a regular old letdown? I don't. I haven't heard anything. Uh, the team being sick. I don't know what a sick team is, other than that. Sad, sad <laughs> showing against Florida a couple of years ago where the whole team was sick. Oh, That's yeah. the only pro time in 30 years. COVID-19? 20, 20, <laughs> no, it wasn't. It, it was wasn't? a year later. Oh. It's like the only time ever in, I was covering fo any sport that that many players on one team couldn't play in the game. Um, that sounded to me more like the culture flu than anything else, <laughs> but... Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear about that this week. Um, could be true, could not be. I don't know. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the second half offensive performance, and what do you mostly attribute it to? It, I think it was a combination of everything, honestly. I mean, I think it's a really good defense playing at home. I think it's the first time a D-line has clearly got the best of, uh, of an A&M O-line this year. I think not having Chase Basantis hurts them. I think he's one of their best players on, on the team, much less the offense. Not having Le'Veon Moss is, is a massive setback, especially when South Carolina is trying to take away Marcel from keeping it. Therefore, the, the, the call is to give it, and you're not, you don't have one of the best backs in the SEC to give it to, and a guy that can – really hit a small crease and make a big play and, and then also start wearing on a defense. So, And then I mean, they were getting pressure on Marcel, and I think that was the most pressure that he's been under since he's been playing, and it showed, and, and, and it, it took a toll on him, and then you saw him make that big mistake late that we haven't seen him make. He's been so poised and so good, but you just take that many plays under duress and that inexperience is going to show it. So, and veteran quarterback, we saw, you know, veteran quarterbacks will make those kind of mistakes, yeah. and, and he did, and it was costly. But I just think, and then, and then I, you know, I see a lot about Colin Klein on the boards and Twitter, and I'm like, man, I, I get it when the offense isn't going good, but I saw this offense go 
four scores and five possessions in the first half. Halftime, they're on pace for 40. Last week, they scored 38. The week, you know, last time they played a top 10 team, they scored 41. I, I don't think it, it's a fine line to kind of go, okay, do we have enough on this OC to judge him? And I think the answer is no when you factor in, like, they don't have a lot of weapons yet. The receivers, the t- they're, they're not, there's not a single preseason or current all-conference candidate at the skill spot save Le'Veon Moss. A- and he was hurt in the second quarter, or in the first quarter. Second drive. Second drive of the game. Mm-hmm. And so you're out there playing against a defense with a lot of all-conference candidates, a handful of them, in fact. A lot of NFL guys, and, and you're without probably your two on offense in Basantis and Moss. And is that an excuse or is that a reason? I think it's part of the reason. And look, they got jacked up at home. They started winning battles at the point of attack. And, and your other your other skill guy that's ta- whose talent level is like way up here is Marcel Reed, but he's in uncharted waters right now and we're, we're we're watching him learn as he goes and he's doing a great job of it but you it's just it's just like i said earlier it's what they did with nussmeyer nussmeyer's an nfl bound quarterback but this is his first year to start yeah so when the pressure dialed up and i mean the pressure of guys coming at you and disguising coverages and all those things that's where at that position experience pays and nuss didn't have it last week and and uh I thought, I thought he, you know, Marcel didn't have it this week. I said earlier though, he's so he's far down on my list of like, kind of trying to say what went wrong in this one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what evidence do you have, or what feelings do you have on why A and M would win out? Um. Well, for starters, I've watched Auburn. Okay. Um, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. They they scare me. Yeah. Okay. They just scored seven against Vandy last week. And, and, but I watch A&M last night. You want evidence. And I'm watching South Carolina routinely get the corner on the Aggies, and it's a concern, no doubt, with, with, with their running back, uh, who I think is one of the best in the SEC down there at all, you know, carrying the ball for War Eagle. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I, I watched Auburn. You know, they beat, they beat Kentucky. But I watched them lose to Vandy and score seven at home. They lost to a bad Oklahoma team. They could have, they were ahead, could have beat them. They lost to Missouri with without with uh, Brady Cook playing like one quarter, mm-hmm. and still lost. But again, could have beat them. They've been competitive against in most of the games they played. They were tied seven seven with Vandy at half. So that be if that was at home, I actually would have no concern. Yeah, on the road, it's definitely a. A scary game if you have everything waiting out in front of you. Mm -hmm. But what evidence? I mean, I could go for an hour. Ask any knowledgeable Longhorn fan. I I saw tweets from him today. I said, look, don't get too excited over what you just saw because with the way A&M was getting those blitzes home, like Quinn Ewers is not avoiding the sacks like Sellers is. And I know that Texas can go over the top and and get the ball out to skill guys better than than, – South Carolina does, mm-hmm. but at the same time, like Texas a and ms I, I don't think Texas doesn't have a power presence in the backfield like Sellers and Sanders. That's what made that thing go. Avoiding sacks, a 240-pound back running downhill, a 250-pound quarterback keeping it. Like Texas doesn't have any of that, yeah. and their O-line had trouble against Vandy. Their O-line got dog-walked by Georgia, no pun intended. <laughs> And AM's defensive line, we're a week removed from them kicking LSU's ass in the trenches with two first round tackles. So, yeah, I mean, and, and, and oh, by the way, shutting down a pretty explosive LSU offense throughout the second half and giving up 23 total points, even with the 17 point first half. So, like, yeah, what I saw last night doesn't beat Texas. Hell, it doesn't beat Auburn. But, I've also seen AM play all year. I've watched Texas play all year. I've seen what Kyle Field has been uh, the last few weeks here. I know what it's going to be. I know what it was against LSU. 
and I know it's going to go up a whole nother level against Texas, that is tough for any team to come in and, and beat. Yeah. It really is. And so, yeah, that's why. That's what I've seen that could show it. Now, I do think getting Moss, being able to get him back or Basantis or Rubino or somebody to kind of keep adding to that ground game would really help. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what is your biggest positive takeaway from the game and your biggest negative takeaway? <coughs> positive. Bree Barber had a good game. Again, that's two out of three yep. where he's had a good game. Yep. That's a positive. I said earlier I like the way the receivers are starting to kind of understand that Marcel can extend plays and they're kind of yeah. getting their, themselves open kind of after the initial part of the route. <clears throat> there seems to be a little chemistry building there, so I like that. But I don't think there are any positives on defense to speak of. Um, just the way they fought back, down 14-0 on the road, yeah. to, in that environment, to take the lead. I know it got away from them late, but, yeah, to come back on the road like that, a good it takes a good team to be able to do that. They didn't, like, show fight. Like, oh, they, they showed a lot of fight, they got blown out, and it ended up not being a blowout. It actually was the opposite. I, I did not like the way they let everything just spiral at the end, but... They're trying to come back from a 10-point deficit in the final three minutes. It's You know, you take some chances you yeah. wouldn't take. But to come back from 14-0 and 17-3 on the road, or maybe it was 17-6, to come back from 14-0 on the road and actually claim the lead right before halftime and go into the break tied, uh, that, was, that was encouraging to me. I don't know what, we talked a second ago, I don't know what happened in the second half, but to put up 20 on that defense in, in a half of football actually impressed me. I wouldn't have thought that A&M would, would do that. Uh, I wish they could have followed Just that the up. the other half, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we still control our own destiny. Why do you think there's always such an overreaction to A&M's results, both wins and losses? We just, I think everyone just wants it so bad. Just cares. Yeah, and it's great, but it's also like when you're doing it, when you do it with the wins, it sets yourself up for the losses, too, to be that much more yeah. devastating. But but why shy away when, when you go and beat a 10-win LSU team or ten, top 10 LSU team at home, and all you do is complain about not breaking through in those games, and then you win two top 10 games in a row at home, after saying we never do it after Notre Dame, and then you win them, um, the whole country's talking you up. You should be able to enjoy that without uh, shying away from it. But when you lose a game like this, like, yeah, I saw some people just so, so much throwing, you know, Elko and even Marcel and Klein, and they threw Connor under the bus earlier, and they threw, like, Throw the defense under the bus. And guys like that have been playing so well for you on that side of the ball, look, they had a shitty night. They did. I mean, they just went out and played a bad football game. And they tried to fight their way out of it. But at the end of the day, they brought – they brought – they did not bring their A game to Columbia. And to do that with that environment – that I said earlier, I think it's as tough as anywhere to play in the country when you're there at night. Listen, I don't know. Like, how did Tennessee fans react? Like, A&M went up there and got their butts kicked two years ago. They were down 17-0, smacked around, smacked around, tried to come back, lost that game. Okay, the Aggies weren't very good that year. <laughs> like, a week or two later, Tennessee goes in there. Right after Tennessee beats Alabama, unbeaten Alabama, first time they beat them in like 15 years, walk off, storm the field, da 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 da, and Hooker, Heisman favorite. They go in South Carolina and lose like 63 to 24. I mean, and then that place is really tough to play at for a big game at night. Yeah. So for AM, who didn't have a Heisman Trophy favorite at quarterback, and who is in year one under a head coach, the Aggies needed to go in there and, and, and play, like, A-game football. And that's a, that's a big ask. And we've seen teams all year fall 
uh, fall short on that going on the road in these really hostile environments when when the gap isn't too big. When the gap is is fairly similar, we're seeing teams go and lose these games. And it, it, look, if A and M was light years better and more talented across the board, they go in there and you can go in with your with your B or or some in the cases like Georgia and Bama, I used to be able to go in with your C game. Those game those days are gone. Georgia's B game almost get get some beat by Florida. Tennessee's B game gets some beat by Arkansas, almost gets some beat by Florida. Ole Miss's B game gets some beat by Kentucky. They lose to LSU. LSU has a half where they don't play their best football. They get humiliated here. Like, it's just going to be like that this year. And, and, and Texas A&M played uh, one half of putrid football, and they got smoked for it. Yeah. So, yeah. And, but, but at the same time, it does, I don't think – I wish that people would be critical – and this is the difference, and this is what people, I, I don't think, understand when I say this. Like, or they want to twist it because, okay, why not just yeah, fill not? up a narrative and make, <laughs> make it sound like I'm saying something I'm not. Be pissed off. Complain. I haven't edited or deleted one thread on this, on this message board this weekend. I'm sure at some point that'll change. Not one. Be pissed off. Be frustrated. Uh, hope for, want more. But I don't think sitting there demanding perfection and excellence or, or demanding that this team doesn't have a single off week where they just lay an egg in year one because I could take you through a lesson in history. I mean, everybody's on Dan Lanning's jock right now, right? He's a great coach. <laughs> yeah. He went 9-3 and three in year one at Oregon. Now, they lost their first game to Georgia like 49-3, to three, but that was Georgia a couple of years ago, and it's game one. But... Dan Lanning went nine and three, and that was like really good. That was also in the Pac-12 with like four games they barely won. Less mile, I don't less mile. Brian Kelly went nine and three in this league that year. He came to Kyle Field and, and did this. He came to Kyle Field, one game away from potentially landing in the playoffs with the Heisman Trophy. The guy who won the Heisman the following season, who's lighting up the NFL, is going to be Rookie of the Year. And they came in here and got dusted by an A&M team that was starting a true freshman at quarterback making his third career start in Connor Wigman. And, and they let Devon A-Chain run all over him, and they lost by about the same amount. They lost by 15 points at Kyle Field. So if Mike Elko goes 9-3, and three, or especially 10-2 and two in year one, you know, this game does matter because 10-2 – and two, could get you, and you might lose the SEC title game and be ten and three, and this could be yeah. what keeps you out. But how do you call that a, a disappointing season? Yeah. And they they could do more. Everyone in the SEC is beatable, and everyone's able to get their ass kicked on a bad night. And South Carolina proved that last night. A and M proved that last week. Georgia proved that in Austin a few weeks ago. Like, if you have a bad night, you're probably going to get your ass handed to you. Other games, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So, How many more you want? Like three. All right. Uh, we, you talked a lot about them, but do you have Chase Basanta's status? Question mark is the question. Yeah, we've talked a lot. I mean, that's that's TBD up in the air still. And uh, I mean, I know I know they're hopeful that they can get him back. Yeah. Uh, West I, mean, I, think, I think like the longer they play, the more games they can get them back. But I, I would love to see personally. I'd love to see him return by Auburn because they Auburn. really could use him. Yeah, for sure. Uh, West Texas Ag says, "Why no throws to Theo?" Hmm. Well, they got the ball to uh, uh, Watson Trey. on a big fourth down yeah. there. Yeah. Um, was that a fourth down or a third and short? I think. But something like that. They needed to yeah, convert. Yeah, that was the one they had to convert and yeah. got it. It was a nice play, really nice design. Um, why no throws to Theo? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if he was running open or I, I do I do think these tight ends are weapons in the passing game and you know, with sometimes a lack of production at receiver, you'd you'd like to see it, but I'm not I'm not sure uh, how open they're getting or what, you know. Yeah, you'd have to to look at it mm -hmm. um from i don't even know this name stevo acp we're gonna go with was elko pressing and being too aggressive 
I I don't know. You, I mean, I do think that is very aggressive going for it in those situations. Yeah. But I don't know if I'd say that was pressing because I forget if it was. I mean, he tried to get, it was not quite as aggressive. But he tried to get pretty aggressive early on against Arkansas. That was closer to midfield, but it was like they were about to go for it and they got a false start, so they had to punt. But I was like, do you really go for it here or do you just pin them deep? Because I think at that time A&M was down like 14-7. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, gosh, do you really want to risk going down 21-7 here and giving them, you know, so I think you'll see him do that. But the crowd being into it and the, everybody up and the where momentum was, it might have felt more like a press than it was. I don't think he really regrets the decision to go. I think if he probably regretted anything, it would be like, I wish we would have either executed or, or got into a better play there or whatever. I think, I think that's kind of going to be there. It's not Lane Kiffin or Dan Campbell levels, but I think he's going to be more aggressive than – than we're Especially used to seeing. On. And by the way, if anyone forgets, we were kissing Jimbo's ass at this time a year ago, one of the rare times that people were giving him credit when they played South Carolina here and it fell, it fell behind either 7 0 or even 10 0, but it was at least 7 and maybe 10 7. And Jimbo went for it with like two, three times mm-hmm. on their side of the field. And everyone was like, oh, why didn't you do that against Alabama a few weeks ago? And ten, you know, so it's always going to be second guess. But I don't, I don't think he was pressing. I think the atmosphere made it feel like he was pressing. I think those are things that you're just gonna, you're gonna see him do from time to time. Yeah. And I'm not saying he'll never go to bed at night and be like, I shouldn't have done that one. Maybe one of those he would feel that way about. I don't know. I doubt he'd ever say it. Yeah, for sure. All right, last but not least, these last these two kind of go hand in hand. Team Ramrod says, why does it seem like the penalties are always so one-sided? Did South Carolina, in your opinion, play a clean game, something no. A&M should bring up to the league office? Also, thanks you for all you do. Thank you for <laughs> appreciating what we do. I appreciate that. But, no, the league office doesn't do shit. <laughs> you know what they do? They tell you, yep. We should have called this. Nope, we shouldn't have called that. Uh, no, you're wrong. That was a good call. Yes, you're right. That was a bad call. And then they don't do a damn thing. They don't do a damn thing. So it's just a waste of time. And I hear coaches say that, and they get fined and stuff. I can say it. It's a waste of time. I don't think that was the most egregious level of officiating I've ever seen. Um, I, I think. A&M committed more penalties than South Carolina did. Now, do I think they should call they, – they should have got them for several holding calls along the way. Like, to me, Didn't when it's going to be until... six penalties for like 60-something yards and a half, yeah. you have to go in at halftime. It's just like in basketball, you see the makeup calls start swinging. So, like, if you ever watch a basketball game and the fouls are like 7-2 to two in the first half or 9-3 to three, – you know with almost certainty that they're going to come out in the second half and they're going to start evening up the foul calls. So get ready because your team's about to get screwed. Yeah, That's what I think should happen in football when it's that big a disparity to go back and go, you have to look at each other and go, are you serious? We had not called a freaking penalty against these guys in a whole half. Mm-hmm. We've called a half dozen Only against Only late A&M. in the third quarter of the first quarter. Yeah, game. late in the third quarter. And that was one they had to call, right? Yeah. I think that was like a – it was a. They had a. I believe it was a false start. Yeah, it wasn't was like one, it like, wasn't right like one. You, yeah. So like, it was obvious. <laughs> the way you even that out is you go. We know that they're holding on every single play, so we're just gonna call one here or there mm-hmm. to start to even this stuff out. Yeah. And I don't think we ever saw that happen. But A and M's penalties, for the most part, I, I wasn't going yipping and hollering and going crazy on. on seeing those thinking they were like blatantly like getting screwed over yeah all right and you want you got one more okay oh we went one more these oreos i don't (laughs) don't need those let's see 
Uh, see, I, you said one more, and now I gotta cook up another oh, one. Oh man, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Let's, All right, and that's it. There I'm we Bill go. Lucci. She's <laughs> Kay Nagley. This is not Ask Lucci. This is a little Sunday edition to the Luchador podcast. Appreciate you guys. Fun, memories, friendship. We're here for all of it. Here for the big moments and the small ones too. We're here for unforgettable triumph, momentary misfortune, and the impromptu throwdown. We're out here each day chasing something great. Call it adventure, call it play, we call it fun. Academy Sports and Outdoors. Have fun out there.